Along the coast of Bulgaria, on the Black Sea, lies a resort called Golden Sands. It's a popular and relatively inexpensive tourist destination for many of the nearby Eastern European nations. And it's also known to be a popular party destination, kind of in the same vein as Ibiza. On June 30th of 2014, a group of five German tourists arrived at Golden Sands to soak up the sun, party, and unwind for a week in some change. Among them was 28-year-old Lars Metank. For the first week, the trip was pretty standard fare, and nothing of note really happened. The group hung out at the resort, they relaxed on the beach, swam at the pool, went clubbing, you know, vacation stuff. But on July 6th, as their vacation was nearing its conclusion, the trip hit a bit of a rough patch. Or it did for Lars anyway. Late that evening, after a full night of partying, Lars's friends all retired to the hotel for the night. But Lars was hungry, so he made what he planned on being a quick stop at a nearby McDonald's before heading back to the hotel. Now, Lars was a passionate football fan, and while he was there, he ran into a group of fellow Germans, who were equally passionate football fans. But they were fans of a different team. As they all waited to order their food, Lars and the other group got into a bit of an argument. An argument that quickly escalated into a physical confrontation. And in the ensuing scuffle, Lars was punched in the face. Then, he showed up at the hotel again the next morning. That morning, Lars complained to his friends that he was suffering from a throbbing headache, and he believed that the punch to the face from the night before may have given him a concussion. So he went to the doctor and was diagnosed with a ruptured eardrum. The doctor advised him not to fly, as the change in air pressure could further aggravate the damage to his ear. This was a bit of a problem though, as the group already had their flight home booked for later that day. But Lars insisted that his friends not change their plans for him, and that he would be fine staying in Bulgaria for a few extra days. So his friends flew home, and Lars checked into a cheap hotel while he waited for his ear to heal. But that night, he began to exhibit some extremely bizarre behavior. He called his mother in the middle of the night from his room, speaking in a whisper, claiming that he was being followed by Russians and that he was looking for a place to hide. Then before she could get him to divulge any further information, he hung up. Later he texted her saying that she needed to cancel his credit cards. Hotel security footage shows that Lars spent the night pacing around the hotel, up and down the foyer, hiding in the elevator, and peering out the windows. At 1am, he left for an hour before returning to his room. Where he went and what he was doing in this hour, no one knows. The next morning, despite his continuing paranoia, Lars was able to make his way to the airport, where he made a quick stop at the airport doctor's office to get approved to fly. As he was getting looked over, he continued his strange behavior. He was erratic and fidgety. The doctor noticed that, despite this just being a routine checkup, Lars was acting very nervous. Nevertheless, his ear was healing well, and he was approved to fly. Then, as Lars was preparing to leave the clinic, a construction worker entered the room. And when Lars saw this man, something within him seemed to break. He began trembling and inaudibly muttering to himself. His strange behavior quickly escalated until, suddenly and unexpectedly, Lars flew out of his chair, leaving all of his luggage behind, including his cell phone, wallet, and all of his clothes, and he ran out of the clinic. He sprinted past the check-in desks and towards the main entrance, left the airport, and headed towards the edge of the parking lot in a sort of staggered jog. He made his way to the edge of the parking lot, where he jumped a fence and disappeared into the forest that borders the airport. And from there, Lars Matank was never seen again. The sad simple fact is that people disappear all the time. It's inescapable in the world we live in. But in certain, unique cases, the circumstances surrounding a disappearance are so utterly bizarre that they just can't be ignored. These cases spark debate and fuel curiosity for many years to come. And many of them we'll likely never have an answer to.
This is Simply Strange, the podcast where anything spooky, weird, and goosebump inducing is fair game. Hello there, everyone, and welcome to episode 17 of Simply Strange. I'm PJ, and I'm thrilled you could join me today. This week, we are going to dip our toes into true crime for the first time in a while. But this story is just so absurdly weird that it almost doesn't even seem like true crime. And that's all I'm going to say about that right now. So without further ado, this is the story of Clarence Roberts. The year is 1970 in Nashville, Indiana, a charming, picturesque little town tucked away amidst rolling hills and valleys about an hour south of Indianapolis. At the time, Nashville was home to about 500 or so people, many of whom were retired, lured to Nashville by its small-town charm and beautiful scenery. It was the kind of mild, quiet town where days come and go, and nothing too unexpected happens. Usually. But something strange was brewing in this sleepy Midwestern town. Something that would give the good people of Nashville something to talk about for many years to come. The Roberts family were a pillar of the community in Nashville. 52-year-old Clarence had been born there in 1918 and lived there for his entire life, save for a period during World War II when he served in the army. He lived with his wife, 49-year-old Geneva, and their four sons. The family was well respected all throughout town for a number of reasons. When Clarence returned home from the military, he worked extremely hard to build a successful life for himself and his wife, whom he married in 1941. He and his brother Carson started a lumber company and opened a hardware store that grew to be quite successful. And in 1950, he ran for Brown County Sheriff, an election that he won by a landslide. He also worked as the director of the Nashville State Bank, and he eventually joined the Masonic Lodge, where he earned 33rd degree status, the lodge's highest honor, and he was one of only three men in the county to do so. He was a model citizen, and he was well liked by everyone in Nashville. As Clarence's entrepreneurial journey continued, he and his family lived a life of success and luxury. He bought a nice house a couple miles north of Nashville, as well as three luxury cars and a pickup truck. Anything that they wanted seemed to be well within their reach. But for the Robertses, their life wasn't quite as glamorous and perfect as the shiny facade that Robert had created for them would suggest. Their upper-class lifestyle came at a price, a price that Clarence's business ventures were simply unable to afford. Clarence eventually found himself deep in debt and was forced to sell his share of the lumber company and hardware store in order to cover his finances. He later took out a loan to finance the construction of an apartment complex, a venture which failed miserably and ultimately left him $200,000 in debt. In October of 1970, Clarence Roberts hit a financial rock bottom when the bank ordered for the repossession of two of his three luxury cars, and the sheriff showed up at his house one day with an order to seize the vehicles. Interestingly enough, the new sheriff in town was his own brother, Warren Roberts. This was a rude awakening for Clarence and the rest of the family, who didn't realize the extent of their debt. It was an event that left Clarence miserable and scrambling for a way to escape the financial chokehold that he found himself locked into. But while things looked bad now, there was still room for them to get a lot worse. And just one month later, they did. On the evening of November 18th, 1970, at around 6 o'clock, one of the Roberts' neighbors, a woman named Ella Cummings, noticed some leaves burning near the base of a tree on the Roberts' property. 
The tree was located right beside the family's barn, which they utilized as a garage and also used for extra storage. Upon seeing this, Mrs. Cummings immediately ran into her house to call the fire department, and then she returned to the scene to watch the fire from a safe distance. To her great concern, the fire spread quickly, engulfing the tree and beginning to work its way towards the barn, which was swallowed up by the flames in what seemed like seconds. By this time, a small crowd had gathered to watch as the doomed barn was eaten away by the flames. As they watched, the fire department finally arrived, about 15 minutes after Ella had initially reported the flames. But by this point, it was too late for the barn, and due to their limited water supply, all the firefighters could really do was assist with damage control. They surrounded the burning barn and ensured that the flames were unable to spread to any nearby houses, while they waited for the roaring fire to run its course. The fire blazed as the final light of day began to fade from the sky, and eventually the light of the fire began to fade with it, until finally the only light that remained was the dim glow of the more stubborn patches of ash scattered about the wreckage. The firefighters pulled out their flashlights and entered what was left of the barn, spraying water to cool the ashes as they slowly worked their way across the debris. They passed the charred remains of support beams and tools, and what was left of two destroyed automobiles that had been parked in the barn. Pretty standard fare. But before long, they stumbled upon something that they hadn't expected. Something very grim. A charred, grisly body, still smoking and lying in the ashes, with its arms and legs apparently burnt off, and a shotgun lying across its chest. Over the coming days, the investigation continued, and a ring was found near where the body was recovered. A 33rd degree mason ring, inscribed with the name Clarence Roberts. Clarence's financial troubles were no secret to the people of Nashville. They were well aware of the proud, once wealthy businessman's descent into crippling debt, and it didn't take long for a narrative to form, explaining the tragic events of November 18, 1970. It came to light that throughout 1970, Clarence had purchased nearly a million dollars in life insurance on himself, and based on what was discovered at the site of the fire, it seemed pretty clear what had happened. Clarence had committed suicide so that his family could cash in on that life insurance policy and escape financial ruin. In fact, he reportedly was not shy about his plan, and according to his good friend and attorney, Florence Bailey, he told Florence exactly what he had planned to do, saying that he was going to commit suicide and to make his wife the richest widow in Brown County. His wife, Geneva, on the other hand, was not so privy to his plan, and was utterly devastated. She had little knowledge of Clarence's financial struggles, nor his plan to save the family from debt, and she struggled to cope with the dreadful turn of events. Soon after Clarence's death, preparations began for what was expected to be a massive funeral. The entire town of Nashville was expected to show up to pay their respects to a great man, who, in the end, fell upon some difficult times. Meanwhile, the body found in the wreckage of the barn had made its way to the county coroner's office, and it's here that our story starts to get a little bit strange. The coroner, a man by the name of Jack Bond, began to examine the body in an effort to confirm the deceased's identity as Clarence Roberts, as well as to confirm the cause of death, believed to be suicide by shotgun. But his examination raised far more questions than it answered as he soon discovered that there were some glaring issues with the narrative that had been constructed to explain the death. First, and this is pretty big, there was no gunshot wound. Certainly not a self-inflicted gunshot wound, something that would have been brutally evident. For Jack, this discovery raised some major red flags, 
calling into question everything that the authorities thought that they knew about the case. On top of the gunshot wound conundrum, Jack was also unable to explain the gold ring that was found near the body. Gold has a lower melting point than bone, yet the body had all of its limbs completely burned away, while the ring was completely undamaged. Something didn't add up here, and given that he was unable to confirm the cause of death, nor the identity of the body, Jack refused to sign Clarence's death certificate. As a result, his funeral was cancelled, and instead, the now unidentified body was unceremoniously buried at Nashville's Memorial Park Cemetery. All of this triggered an uncontrollable downward spiral for his widow. Given the questionable circumstances surrounding Clarence's death, Geneva was denied the payout on his life insurance policy. Alone, and having inherited her husband's massive debt, she was forced to sell everything she owned. Her house, the remaining vehicles, and all of her property. Her adult sons left her, her friends abandoned her, and she took a job as a dishwasher in a local diner, and moved into a tiny rented trailer. The unfortunate woman kept to herself, and would often be seen wandering the streets of Nashville, wearing dirty, disheveled clothes and muttering under her breath, as her sanity seemed to slip away from her, just as her husband had. Over the coming years, as Geneva mourned the loss of her husband and struggled to get by, the rest of the town moved on without him. But not without their fair share of rumors. Everyone seemed to have a different idea of what happened that fateful night. Some said Clarence really had just lit the barn on fire and committed suicide. Others believed that Clarence murdered someone else and used the body to fake his own death. There were rumors that Clarence and Geneva were in on it together and planned on leaving town with the insurance money at the first opportunity. Some thought that Clarence loved his family too much and he would never have committed suicide, so maybe he was murdered. Everyone had their theories, but no one truly knew what exactly happened to Clarence Roberts, and it would stay that way for many years to come. As time went on, new details regarding the case would slowly surface, but for the most part, any new information just made the bizarre story even more convoluted. However, one thing started to become harder and harder to ignore. The supposed death of Clarence Roberts was beginning to take on a sinister tone. More details began to surface, suggesting that the body found in the fire did not belong to Clarence Roberts. The body recovered only had one tooth remaining, while Clarence, despite wearing dentures, did still have many of his own teeth. Additionally, x-rays of the body were compared with Clarence's medical records, and they weren't a match. Upon further examination of the body, it was discovered that what was left of the bones in the arms and legs had linear marks indicating that its limbs had not simply burned off in the fire, and that the body had likely been butchered. There were even witnesses who claimed to have seen Clarence since his supposed death, twice in Indiana and once in Mexico, although their reliability is a little bit questionable. Given all of these developments and the information yielded by the coroner's investigation, it was looking highly possible that the body in the barn did not belong to Clarence Roberts, that instead of committing suicide to collect his life insurance, he had instead killed someone and used their body to fake his own death. But if someone else truly was the victim here, then who? A report soon surfaced of an event that had occurred two days prior to the fire. Clarence had been sighted in Morgantown, another town a little more than 10 miles north of Nashville. According to the report, Clarence had run into an unidentified and obviously intoxicated homeless man on the street and offered the man dinner at a nearby tavern. The man accepted, and the two of them went to the tavern where they ate, made some idle chit-chat, and Clarence supposedly offered the man some work doing odd jobs around his house. While the man was clearly very inebriated, it seemed to be an otherwise harmless exchange. Until, that is, the man unexpectedly collapsed. 
appearing to suffer some sort of medical emergency, perhaps a seizure. Witnesses were quick to call an ambulance, but Clarence had a different idea. He insisted that it would be quicker to just take the man straight to the hospital. So he did, or so he said he did. Clarence rushed out of the tavern to his car and pulled it around to the front door, where he loaded the ill man into the back seat and the pair left. An ambulance arrived at the scene a short while later, but by then the two were long gone. The unidentified man was never seen again, and local hospitals have no record of him ever actually checking in. If this report is to be believed, then it would seem that investigators had their victim. But the problem is, no one had any idea who this drunken vagrant was, and that was not going to change throughout the entirety of the investigation. Now, while everything up to this point is pretty weird, the weirdness has not peaked yet. And there's one final twist left in the story of Clarence Roberts. On November 30th, 1980, at around midnight, firefighters received a call reporting that there had been an explosion at the trailer belonging to Geneva Roberts, and that the trailer had immediately erupted into a raging fire. Firefighters rushed to the scene, but by the time that they got there, the damage had already been done, and the little trailer was filled with smoke and completely destroyed. They fought the fire and eventually managed to extinguish the flames. Then, just as they had on a very similar evening some ten years ago, they entered the charred wreckage of the home, only to find two scorched bodies amongst the debris, a man and a woman both of whom died of smoke inhalation. Upon further investigation, it was determined that this fire was no accident, and that it was arson, seemingly started by some unknown party and intentionally accelerated using turpentine. Police were able to immediately identify the female body as that of Geneva Roberts, but the male, on the other hand, was a little more complicated. First responders believed that the male body may be that of Clarence Roberts, but given that he had not been seen in the last 10 years, it was difficult to say for sure. However, this didn't stop the news from spreading like wildfire all throughout town. The next morning, Nashville was buzzing with word of Geneva's death, and for the second time, Clarence's as well. The man who died twice was getting massive attention all across the state in a mystery that would live on for many years to come. Immediately following the fire, the male body was assessed by a team of criminal pathologists and forensic specialists who compared the body with old x-rays and dental records belonging to Clarence and confirmed that this body was, in fact, the body of Clarence Roberts. But not everyone was quite so ready to accept that this man was Clarence Roberts and among the skeptics were his sons. Despite the fact that the identity of the body was confirmed to be Clarence, his sons still disagreed, claiming that the man who died in the first fire 10 years previously was their father. While they organized and paid for the funeral of their mother, they refused to have anything to do with the other body. This body, the body that was positively identified as Clarence Roberts, was buried by the state in an unmarked grave, and instead the unidentified man was exhumed and buried next to Geneva under a gravestone that read Clarence Roberts. Although, oddly enough, his date of death is listed as 1980, the date of the second fire. Who he is, we'll likely never know for sure, and instead Clarence Roberts will forever be known as the man who died twice.
Well, as always, thank you so much for listening. I hope you all enjoyed this week's episode. And if you did, maybe tell a friend. I want more people to hear the show, and I bet some of you wonderful folks out there know some other wonderful folks who might enjoy it also. As usual, you can connect with the show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. All of those links are in the episode description, or you can just search Simply Strange. You'll find it. I would like to extend a huge thank you to Alyssa H. and Molly S., the show's newest supporters on Patreon. I really, really appreciate the support. If anyone else would like to join them, feel free to check out the show's Patreon page at patreon.com slash simply strange. You can also get cool stickers and stuff, so that's fun. And that's about it for this week, everyone. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back in two weeks with another spooky, weird, and wild story for you. And until that time, I've got another podcast for you to check out, Southern Spirits. Hey, y'all. I'm Leah Lawrence. I'm her husband, Mitch Lawrence. And we host the Southern Spirits Podcast. Each week, we'll sip on a Southern brewed craft beer or wine and toss back a Southern distilled liquor, and I'll let y'all know how I feel about them with a review. And after we are good and tipsy, I'll bust out a couple of strange, spooky tales from the American South. We are all about true crimes, mysteries, paranormal activity, and cryptozoology. Basically, if it's Southern and boozy, we'll drink it. And if it's Southern and weird, we'll talk about it. So join us as we drink our way through the folklore of the South. Find the Southern Spirits Podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Bye, y'all.